Right. We're back on air. Welcome once again to Once Upon a Time in the Ashes, our countdown of the English and Australian cricketers who played in only one Ashes test. Greg Campbell, John Stevenson and Kevin Eggleston, on behalf of his late brother Alan, were kind enough to take us through the 1989 Ashes in England. The crushing 4-0 win, the first of eight consecutive series wins for Australia, a period in which they won 28 of 43 tests played. It's now time to embrace the 1990s, and in this decade we find a further seven cricketers who played their one and only Ashes test. Peter McIntyre and Joe Angel will tell us their stories in the next two episodes, but today it's the turn of Steve Watkin of Mystegg Town and Glamorgan. Steve has much in common with Jonathan Agnew, yes the voice of TMS, but more importantly an esteemed member of our One Ashes Test Wonder Club. Both played three test matches, both can include Viv Richards among their test wickets, both Wisden Cricketers of the Year and both finish in their test careers with a game against the Aussies. But unlike Aggers, Steve made a match-winning contribution in his one and only Ashes test, taking four crucial wickets in the second innings as Australia were bowled out for 229. Time to find out how he did it. Steve Watkin was a Welsh right-arm seam bowler who was a stalwart of the Glamorgan side from 1986 to 2001. He took 902 first-class wickets at 27.92, taking five wickets in an innings on 31 occasions and 10 in a match four times. He played four ODIs and three tests for England, including his one and only Ashes test in the sixth and final game of the 1993 series at the Oval. Steve, welcome to Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. How are you, Graham? Robert Croft, your old teammate, said that playing for Glamorgan was like playing for Wales and playing for England was like playing for the British Lions. Do you agree with that? Well, well, I do. I probably, as I was older than him, I probably thought that before he, he actually said it on TV. But yeah, I mean, I played in um, you know 1991, which is kind of earlier than he, and I went on a tour to uh, to West Indies in in '94 uh, as well. So I mean, the one thing I did take with me, uh, which was taken around the the, the sort of uh, islands, was a, a Union Jack symbolising that very thing. I don't think I used the word British Lions, but I was well aware of. The Great Britain thing. Yeah, I certainly saw that as, as a British thing rather than a, an, an English thing. And the amount of supporters on the tour put on a Welsh people there because uh, me and Matthew from Glamorgan t- w- w- were on that tour in the, in 94. So, so the answer to the question is um, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we'll come on to the West Indies and we'll come on to that Ashes test. And of course, your brilliant form for Glamorgan and the 1997 County Championship. I'd just like to take you back to the beginning to start with. You grew up in South Wales. Was, you know, there's a lot of beaches around there. Was beach cricket your first introduction to cricket? Uh, probably. I mean, I, I, I was born in a place called Kyra, which is near my state. But I was actually brought up in a place called Dufferin Ronda, which is in the Avon Valley near Port Albert. So my upbringing was a, a mining village with with a very steep-sided valley. So there weren't a lot of flat bits there. So first and foremost, I was a, a, a footballer, a, a goalkeeper. And everybody in Wales played rugby as well. So, you know, football, rugby and anything else, really. I, I didn't really start taking cricket seriously until I was 15. I, I'd best around in, in what I would describe as the back streets, really, the, the road behind me, which was a, bit, a flat tarmac, although it was a little bit on a hill. So, I mean, that, that's where I kind of learned my cricket. We did go to Puff Call on holiday in the centres. So I did play a bit of beach cricket, but essentially my cricket was learned on a bit of tarmac and some grassy area near it, behind the chapel, basically a field behind the chapel. So at the age of 15, I formally went to join a cricket club. So that was the first time I really played cricket, which was my stick town. And then it kind of snowballed from there, really. And by the end of that season, I played in the first team. My stick town were then in the first division of South Wales League, so reasonable standards. So. And then uh, that winter... Started going to Glamorgan Nets. Uh, it all happened very quickly from once I started, really. Yeah, how did that happen, the, the chance with Glamorgan? Did somebody spot you or did you go for a trial? Or? No, no, basically. I mean, uh, a chap called Lloyd Davis, who's, who's basically followed Glamorgan for most of, his, most of his life, really. He rang Tom Carter right up and basically said, I think I've got someone you should look at. I got invited to Nets and basically that was it. Yeah. 
I mean, you, you said you played a lot of sports. Was it obvious when you started playing cricket? You thought, oh, hang on, I'm a bit good at this. And you were obviously better than some of the other lads you were playing with? No, I didn't, it wasn't that way at all, really. I'm I was quite, a, quite a shy bloke. And I would say never really had a great deal of confidence in, in, in stuff. I mean, I knew I, I enjoyed my sport. And I, I guess I, I would have had a good hand by coordination. I'd be, I was, you know, played a lot of football, played a lot of rugby. I had a go at tennis and basically all summer, all winter doing something. But yeah, I, I had no idea if I was any good at cricket. Only it was only what people told me. So you know, and at, at every level, I probably struggled for a little bit of confidence. You know, from where I was, uh, essentially a, a, a valley boy, really. You know, going out to what I perceived as the big open world, and it was only going down to Neath. It wasn't very far at all. But <laughs> I mean, to me, it was a bit of a tra- track back uh, when I was younger. So. So no, I had no idea where I was going, going or how good I was. So um, moving things on then, do you remember your first class debut that came against Worcestershire, didn't it? Yeah, um, I first played for the Morgan second team in, in 82. So pretty much two years after I'd actually started playing cricket, which was quite, you know, quite a phenomenal rise, really. I was in UIC, South Long Institute of Higher Education at the time. So in my second year and I got, I got the call up. Yeah, and I remember it well. I mean, it, it, we go to Worcester who were pretty much... Top of the tree at the time. Some very good players, Graham Heck, Phil Neal, Damon Dolavira. I mean, it's, it's Tim Curtis. Quite a lot of them went on to play at the highest level. So, you know, for Newport as well. Yeah, I mean, I bowled in a bit, bit nervous as, as you would do in your first class debut. To be honest with you, I don't know whether I bowled well or not. I know I bowled some good balls. So, and I got Graham Hick out of my first first class wickets. He was dropped previously. I bowled a ball, he nicked it, and he was dropped it. I think it's first slip. I, w- I would say he dropped it, but it was dropped at first slip. And a couple of overs later, he just had a bit of a pull at one. And Hugh Morris caught him and mid on for me. He was in college with me at the time in South Morgan Institute. So that, 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 that was good. I think I got something like off the top of my head, two for 75 in 15 overs or something in the first innings, something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, spot on. Two for 75, looking at the stats. And and then you absolutely burst onto the scene, didn't you? That 88 season and then the following season, 89. I mean, you took 46 first-class wickets in 88 and then doubled that the following year and got 92. So, yeah, that's a pretty good introduction to um, first-class cricket. Yeah, I mean, when I um, when I finished college, I went off, off to South Africa for a, well, five months, as it turned out. I had that time in the winter to bowl a bit, learn a bit more about my bowling. And then, you know, so I kind of hit the ground running when I came back in, in 88. Didn't, I wasn't in the first team the start of 88, but I, I think I kind of forced my way in, did well in the second team. And then once I got in, um, that, that pretty much was it, really. I, I played continuously in the first team until I finished, I think, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 89 was your best ever in terms of wickets. Was that... Was that the best you ever bowled, or was that just because the batsman didn't know you? Or? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, obviously, I played in 88, so they've kind of got to know a little bit about me. And 89, there's quite big scenes on the balls back in 89, and the wickets that year weren't particularly good. You know, I, I had a kind of habit of hitting the seam, and the wickets kind of suited me. So got on a bit of a roll, really. The Morgan themselves, we didn't do very well. I think we ended bottom of the championship, which is w- weird, really. Yeah, I can't put my finger on it. You know, I didn't know what was good bowling or bad bowling, to be honest with you. I just ran in and, you know, basically did this, the simple things quite well. Trying to hit a good line, hit the good length, seam up. Didn't really, you know, try to be clever at all. Just, just trying to do the basics well. And that was, that was it, really. But taking that, that amount of wickets is going to get you noticed, isn't it? I mean, were people in Wales talking about you in terms of the England test side? Or, or were people in England talking about you for their test side? Well... Yeah, I played in that year. I played for an England A team in in the Netherlands, oddly. So I had just a couple of a bit of experience there with the England setup. Yeah, I was talked about. I had some communication from England regards playing, but I bowled a lot of overs that year, and I think the feeling was that I was perhaps too tired or maybe too much of a risk to play in a five-day Test match. So perhaps that's why that one never happened. Because towards the end of the series, I can't remember if I spoke to Mickey Stewart or he talked. To, about me in the press or something like that. But yeah, I was quite close to the end of that year in 89. Yeah, it was ironic that they thought you would break down when you were relatively injury-free throughout your entire career. How do you explain your longevity and why do you think bowlers today seem to break down more often? Well, obviously I'm still working in the game, so um, I'm working with bowlers every day. It is a tough one. When I was playing, it, it, you know, we talked about specificity of training. Specificity to me is, is the art of bowling. 
I bowled in more overs and I bowled all year round pretty much, if not abroad, then in, in indoor schools in the winter. And I build up my strength and stamina through that. In the modern day, it's quite a lot more gym-based than, than it used to be. Not as much running as we used to do and certainly not a, as much bowling as we used to do. Uh, the argument would be, I, I guess, is that, you know, with the gym-based stuff, bowlers, do they bowl a bit quicker? I, I don't know where the evidence is there because we didn't have the speed guns out every day of the week sort of thing. Like that feeling, the answer is somewhere in between. A bit more bowling, a little bit less molly coddles. My, my gut feeling is that there's more injuries these days than it was back in our day, but that, that might just be my imagination. Obviously, you were doing brilliantly in 89 and um, taking a load of wickets, but Glamorgan weren't doing that well. But all that changed in 1990, didn't it, when a certain Vivian Richards walked into the changing room? How was that? And what are your memories of playing with him? Yeah, um, obviously, a, a, a box office signing, a legend of the game with so much experience. And to be honest, he just won like one of the players in the dressing room. There was no airs and graces about Viv. Regardless, uh, I mean, people would often see him walk onto the field with uh, with the confidence, or some people would call it arrogance. But in the, in the dress, he's quite quiet. I wouldn't say he was shy, but I mean, he had something to say, he'd say it. But I mean, generally, he was perhaps not what I thought he might be. <laughs> I got on quite well then. He, he had his moments in the dress room where he, you know, he got frustrated or angry with things. But I mean, that, that was few and far between. The one thing Viv brought to the club was is winning mentality. I mean, we hadn't won anything or reached anything for a long time. Uh, I think 1977, the Gillette Cup final was the, the last time we got anywhere, I think. He wouldn't take losing as uh, for an answer, so to speak. He, he certainly was the winner. I can't remember 1990 so much, but was it 1993 when he came to the four when, when we won the Sunday League? It was like over a, over a period of time. And it, and it was his last year that he really came to the front, you know, showed us what what winning was all about, really. We won the Sunday League. I think we were semi-finals in the, in the NatWest Cup and we were third in the Championship. We, we could have won all three titles that year. And then weirdly, 1991 was then your test debut. Suddenly, you're playing against the great man. How was that? Yeah, uh, every level, every time I step up a level, I, I openly get a bag of nerves. I mean, playing my first club game, first start, and my first Championship game. And then obviously play test cricket. Yeah, again, a bag of nerves. But that happened quite quickly. I wasn't actually originally in the squad. I think Derek Pringle had a, had a sore back or something. So I was brought in as cover for him. And then I think it was Chris Lewis who went down with a migraine on the morning of the game. So, you know, all the nervousness before. And I didn't really get because I wasn't, you know, I didn't expect to play. But I did play and I got a wicket without conceding a run. I got Desmond Haynes caught by Jack Russell. Yeah, bowled okay that test match, not brilliant. They bowled good balls, bowled a lot of bad balls. I bowled better in county cricket than I did in that test match. Put it down to a little bit of nerves. Uh, not used to playing in front of, obviously, the, the TV cameras, the big crowds. Got picked for the next test at Lords, which is an experience in itself. That the thing I remember most about Lords, weirdly, is batting on a Saturday afternoon with uh, Robin Smith, <laughs> which was yeah, not known for my batting, as, as you would know. I think I batted about 50 minutes for the partnership with Robin Smith for about 40, which which basically got us up to uh, whatever the West Indies total was. I think they got just over 400 and we got to about 350, 360. And then it rained for the rest of the game. And then I was I was dropped for the next game. <laughs> yeah. Well, just go back, a, go back a second to that first game because obviously you're far too modest. So I'll, I'll let Wisdom describe your exploits in that game. You demolished the visitors' middle order in the second innings, dismissing... Hooper, Richards and Logie for 11 runs. That must have felt pretty special. Well, it, it was. I At the time, I can remember feeling like I was used to watching Ian Botham and, you know, his great performances in the kind of 70s and 80s. So he, he was still uh, available to be selected. So I, essentially, I was in the team as kind of instead of him, but not quite. You know, I remember thinking like that's what Ian Botham used to do. One, two, three wickets in a short period of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go for a few runs and get a few wickets. <laughs> What did Viv say when he got him out? Did he say anything to you as he walked off the pitch? No, he didn't say anything. But in, in the first innings, he, he got hold of me a bit. I think he got 60 or 70. He whacked me down the ground a couple of times. You know, obviously, I was still aware of that in the second innings, that, that he might go hard at me. But, I mean, I, I just bowled a, a good left ball, which kind of nipped away. He tried to whip it over mid-wicket like he used to do, and he lead an edge. But Graham Gooch caught it. It's fair to say that, you know, that gave me a, a great deal of pleasure being a teammate, being... Viv Richards, one of the greatest players uh, of all time in a test match. So, I mean, that was that was my prize wicket. I, I probably ever, actually, I've come to think of it, yeah. yeah. 
Do you think it helped that you bowled to him in the nets at Glamorgan? Um, no, it didn't help at all. When he did net, he actually practised his defence more than his attack. I think he was pretty, pretty comfortable with what he could do when attacking the ball. But, you know, my memory of him back in the nets was working on his defence. You know, he might whack a couple towards the end of the net, but basically that's what he did. And that game was actually the, the first test there that uh, when you helped bowl... West Indies out for, what was it, 162. That was actually England's first home win against the West Indies since 1969. Now give us a bit of an insight to the dressing room at that point. I mean, what's it like coming into the dressing room as an outsider? You know, you, you say you're nervous when you, you make your debuts, understandably. And what's it like after the match? Because then you've just won this game, this huge game for the first time since 69. Are there big celebrations there? I mean, because you don't know the players that well, do you? Or did you know them from the county circuit? I knew a couple because I'd been on a A tour. So I knew Michael Afton, Graham Thor. I'd come across Graham Hick a few times because Worcester have been where they were. We played against them quite a lot of times. I knew all the dressing room, really, by because we played against them and, and, and whatnot. I mean, in the dressing room was, was comfortable and fine. I had no issues. All the players were really good. Uh, regard celebrations, I mean, it, it literally was a case of, I think we were meant to go home that night, but I think the ECB, or the Tessa County Cricket Board at the time, I think they were called, uh, they put us up for another night, so we stayed and, yeah, went out somewhere. There were a few champagne bottles flying around, uh, I seem to remember, and uh, and I think we were promised a couple, but they disappeared, and, and we never, you know, I never got one anyway, so. Um, yeah, so that was that. Stayed up overnight, uh, got, went back to Neath the, the next day. You retained your place for, for the next match at Lords, which, you know, you fully, fully deserve to do after that brilliant performance. Didn't go so well at Lords, but were you still disappointed not to get picked again? I mean, you know, you'd think you'd get a little bit of a run in the side after that performance at Headingley. Yeah, well, we only, uh, in our game at, uh, at Lords, we only bowled one in innings. And, yeah, if you look at it, I bowled 15 overs and for 60 runs. Lords, the funny place to bowl, as most people will tell you, because of the slope. And I bowled from the pavilion end, I think. Mostly, I, I bowled a bit from the other end. But, but yeah, I, I didn't bowl well. And I, as I said to you, I didn't really bowl well in the first test, to be honest, other than bowl some good balls to get wickets. I wasn't totally expecting to play the next game after that. Uh, and I was left out. Graham Gooch rang me out. I, I remember being left out. I, I, we were playing at Liverpool. And he, he rang me. And there's, there's an old dress room in Liverpool. And I took the phone call. And he, he just said, look, you're not making the next test match. Didn't give me a, any particular reason, but he yeah, didn't need to really. Uh, he said such and such was coming in, but you know he did ring me up. In all fairness to him, and you know, did the right thing regards communication. So yeah, at least he did that. And then let's move this on to Ashes cricket. Is that in your mind? Are you thinking that that's the the games I really want to play in as a cricketer? That's what I've always aimed for. Uh, firstly, I, I, all I'm looking to do is bowl well for Good Morgan, To be honest. You're 93, you know, we've got a pretty good side then, more experienced team, uh, you know, the likes of Steve James, Crofty, Adrian Dale. I mean, it, uh, we, I think we signed Ron Lefebvre as a, as a, as a one-day bowler, but, you know, he did well in the championship stuff as well. So basically people are coming into their prime, becoming very good cricketers. So, we, you know, our team on paper looked OK. Add to that, you know, Viv Richards, uh, winning mentality in his, I think, yeah, he was his final year. Um, so all I'm looking to do is do well for Glamorgan and see what comes of that. And as it happens, that year, from a county perspective, was probably, through all forms of cricket, the best year Glamorgan have had ever, I would think. I know we won the championship in 97, but in all, all across all formats, that was probably our best year. So I'm not thinking of test cricket or anything. But as the season develops, I kept on picking up more wickets. Glamorgan kept winning. Me and Matthew, both in the public eye, Matthew's having a very good year. And it got to a point where England had lost the first three test matches, I believe. And they started to make changes. I, I was in the squad for, for the test at Edgebaston, uh, which I thought I was going to play, you know, having been you know, in pretty good form and good rhythm. But I, I wasn't picked for that test match. I think they chose, I think it looked like it was going to turn. So I think uh, they played an extra spinner. Basically, you're in the squad. Of, I think it was, it was probably 12 then, squad of 12 maybe. So the, the options, I uh, think, were playing extra spinner or playing extra seamer. Uh, I can't remember where the conversation went, but they, they, they just felt it was going to turn. And, you know, England lost that test match as well. So it was basically 4-0 down, going into the last test. You know, I, I did nothing wrong. So I was in the fifth te- squad of the fifth test. Pretty much knew I was going to play that one because we 4-0 down in the series, uh, lost the previous test. Two changes made, Angus Brees. There was, there was some theory that me and him wouldn't, gel as a unit because we were similar 
I never thought that. I, I you know, Angus, a bit taller than me, probably not, not as quick, but probably more accurate. So we were kind of similar, but we weren't. I think I probably had a little bit more variation maybe than Angus, uh, whether you would agree with that's what I thought anyway. So we actually probably complimented each other as, as well. Yeah, the feeling was that he was in my way a lot. Rightly so, because he's such a fine bowler anyway. But So yeah, they decided to pick us, uh, me, me, Angus Fraser, and Devin Malcolm as, um, as, as the bowling unit. I mean, Devin bowled in that test match, I remember, very, very quickly indeed. Um, and, you know, we were a good foil for him. Kind of two accurate, fairly accurate bowlers with an out-and-out fast bowler. So that, that seemed to work quite well. I mean, going into the test match the night before, I was a little bit nervous. And we batted first. I can't remember whether we won the toss, but I think we probably did. I remember, I think it was Graham Thorpe going down with an injury on the morning of the game. He got, I think he broke his thumb or got hit in the thumb. Uh, so Mark Rampakash was called up. So oddly enough, we didn't have Levin there before the start of the game. So he came into squad late. Yeah, so we batted all the first day. I was batting by the end of the day. I got it on the, hit on the forearm by Mervyn Hughes. You know, he had a few words to say, which, you know, he, he, it was almost laughable, to be honest, because you hear about Merv Hughes and, the, you know, he, he loves, loves a chat, but, it, uh, <laughs> you know, for somebody from, a, from the Valley, like I was, his water of a duck's back. I mean, it's just... <laughs> so that was my first day. I, was, I, was, I spent the first night of the Test match Worry about my batting rather than rather than my bowling. Yeah. yeah, I managed to get thirty the next day batting with, with Angus. So we yeah you know, we struggled. We got well, we got three seventy, which is a pretty good score at the Oval. So yeah, and it was time to bowl. Yeah, and then well, you spoke about Murphy, so he was your first wicket, wasn't he? Um, in that Test match, he was, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he went to cover. I think. <laughs> yeah, you got two two for eighty seven in the first. Yeah, yeah, bowled pretty well through the innings. I mean, I I, I mentioned before and. Quite honest, uh, you know, talking about the way I bowled. I mean, the first two test matches didn't bowl so well. But in that test match, I, it, it was it, it was how I bowled in, in county cricket. Hardly bowled a bad ball. The wicket at the Oval was basically a good cricket wicket, good pace and carry in it. You know, I was used to Sapphire Gardens back in the day was was quite slow and low. So playing a, a wicket with a bit of pace and bounce was enlightening, I suppose. <laughs> So, you know, not not used to it. Uh, but yeah, but really well. Um, it moved, it was, uh, uh, yeah, he hit when the cover he did. It, it's not a, a typical fast bowler's kind of wicket, but you know, I bowled well enough to to win the right to to have a you know a bit of a bit of luck and you know, he had a straight to cover, uh, which was a relief because uh, I mean bowled so well during the day, I kind of felt I deserved that. And I it followed up, but I got Paul Rifle out pretty quickly after that. Decent ball. Ball rifle, Nick one, Matthew Maynard caught it, which was, which was good. Yeah, that's a nice little combo again. Yeah, absolutely. And then, well, you really came to the fore, though, didn't you, in the in the second innings? Because if we go back to that West Indies match, it was the the middle order you decimated there. This time, it was the top three that you routed. Australia were thirty for three, and you had all those wickets. Yeah, it was uh, again sur- surreal moments. <laughs> Slater, Taylor, and Boone. Yeah, you know, they were good wickets. I mean, there's a bit of fortune in, in some of the wickets. I mean, I think Slater, you know, replays would have shown afterwards that, you know, when I bowled the ball, short ball, uh, it looked like it came off his off his wrist and it went through to the keeper. Uh, replays have shown like it, it, it hit his elbow. But, I mean, these days it probably would have been ruled out because of the DRS. So, yeah, a bit fortunate there. Mark Taylor, he played around, bowled him. Boone left one first ball, uh, giving out LBW. Um, again, that one. Would have gone to a video replay, but as he'd left the ball, I mean, uh, yeah, he was out. But I went past the bat so many times that in ends, yeah, I could have got Pfeiffer, uh, to be honest. I mean, it, yeah, I was really pleased with the way I bowled. The, the, the nature of the wickets didn't complement the way I bowled, I, I think. What do, you, what do you want as a fast bowler? A little mix to the keeper, bowls, LB, but you know, I was particularly pleased. I, I got the, the keeper out, what was his name again? Ian Healy. Healy, Ian Healy, that's right, yeah. I got his shirt. I got. It. I kept his shirt. I shared this. Uh, I, I changed shirts at the end. I, I knew he was a good hook for the ball and a bit compulsive. So uh, when I came back off my second spell after taking three in the first, I bowled a really good bumper, uh, which you know I rushed in top edge. And Matthew Maynard took a very good catch running towards the boundary. So he's feeling a second slip, I think. But it, you know he turned around top edge caught it. So you know I was on four four for thirty, I think something like that at the time. You know at this point, um, I'm looking at a five five wicket haul. In a test match, which I'm getting on the honours board, those things are going through my head, and there's still four wickets left of the innings. So I, f- I think I finished that spell. I was brought on 
we took a couple of more wickets and then I think uh, Australia put a bit of a partnership together. I think we were always looking like winning the game. I think it was Rifle and a couple of the lower order players anyway. They, they put a partnership on. Uh, Rifle got hit, hit in the head by Dev Malcolm, I seem to remember. So he's a bit groggy. He would have, he would have gone off these days for sure. He had been a concussion. He, he batted quite nicely. I, I, I had an opportunity to get my five wicket haul. There were, there were a couple of near misses. Shane Morn was the other one batting. He played a couple of down to third man, uh, backed away a little bit, a sliced a couple of which landed short. You know, he top edged a couple, but I slapped a couple through the covers, I seem to remember. But yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, I didn't get my five there, basically. <laughs> I tried very hard to get one, but we won the test match. It's the most important thing. And that was the main thing. Well, just picking up on a couple of things uh, that you mentioned there, just quickly go back to Slater, because I was also reading there was a bizarre incident when the ball came out of your hand, landed in the covers, and he obviously was a dead ball, but he ran up and smashed it to the boundary for four. Yeah, I was trying to slow a ball. I, I used to bowl a slower ball, which basically uh, it, it was um, what I call a split finger slower ball. So you just widen the grip of the ball and, and the ball comes out slowly. So I thought I'd try this at that point, not sure why. Slater as attacking cricketer, I thought I could probably do it with a bit of a variation. It, it went wrong, came out of the hand wrong, and it landed it in the cover somewhere, 20, 30 yards away from Slater. Most people these days would just say, pick a ball up, but he wandered across, he whacked it with four. I actually thought at the time, I didn't show it, but I wasn't particularly happy with with the fact that he'd, he'd gone and whacked it with four. Um, and I was thinking the cricketing gods are probably going to be with me. Here. And uh, I don't know how many balls later, three or four balls later, Hit him on the arm guard, giving out. Happy days. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, how does everyone react to that? How did Michael Atherton react when he did that? Or the umpires? Did, does anyone say anything? Uh, no, nothing really. <laughs> just like, you know, I don't, I didn't think I reacted. I just, he just stood still. Uh, I think I was walking back to my mark. I think, I don't know, he whacked it and he walked back to the crease. Nothing said. Yeah, I just thought, hang on. There we are then. That's the way you want to play there, <laughs> if you know what I mean. If you want to play like that. Bernie Mayer was the umpire, and he would have saw that. And you, you almost feel that if it's a 50-50 decision, you want those 50-50s to go with you. And if you behave in the right way, even these days I'm telling the players I coach, you know, always look after the umpire, always be polite, because you never know. There's always a 49-51 centre. And if, if you treat the umpire in the appropriate way, you know, whether, whether you think it or not, deep inside, subconsciously, the umpire will go with you. Definitely. And then use a rugby example as well. You know, Sam Warburton, and someone like him, you know, he's praised for the, the way he speaks to the referees for that very reason, isn't it? Be respectful and you never know what might happen. And then, yeah, sorry, go back to Shane Warne then, because it must be so weird now talking about him now that he's, um, he's passed away. That series was Ball of the Century series as well, uh, Old Trafford. And then obviously you were bowling to him and facing him um, on the wicket. So, so what was that like? Because you didn't do too well when you were batting against him, did you? No, I didn't face him the first innings. I, I batted okay first dig, I think. So I got 13, which was, yeah, I was happy with that. I think me and Angus were in about 30. Second innings, uh, Warren was, uh, was on bowling. He's into one of his spells. Boys from the dressing room were trying to give me advice, but I think they were, they were confusing me more than anything. They were, watch for this, uh, uh, you know. You know, trying to fiddle with the hand, do this, that, and the other. You know, my head, my head, you know, you're facing Shane Warne, who's got 30 odd wickets in the series, who's pulled the ball of the century. So I've gone up to bat, my head's thinking, oh, I just watch his hand, watch his hand. And then he, he bowled me a big full toss. So I just froze and I just let it hit me, hit me in the shin, and the yeah, umpire gave me out. On the replay, oddly enough, on the replay, it looked like he was sliding down. The moral of the story is that my, I was frazzled before I went out uh, to face him, to be honest with you which is probably indicative of, through his career, he used to do people mentally before they got out, went out to bat. You know, a great cricketer. I mean, it's, it's you know, like you said, um, chatting about him now, you, you kind of think, is he, is he really gone? You know, and um, bizarre. And what was he like on the pitch? You mentioned someone like Merv Hughes, who was a bit of a sledger, but kind of someone from the Valleys that probably didn't make, you know, much odds to you. But what was Shane Warne like on the, on the pitch in the changing rooms? Yeah, look, he... You know, when he's bowling to high-end bats, when I'm sure he's got a lot of clever things to say, but he wasn't going to waste any of his energy with any... Uh, uh, <laughs> he, did, he, had nothing to, he had nothing to say to me, to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah. I haven't actually seen your wicket, but I saw Adam Hollyer got, got bowled by Warren and he just left it straight ball. And he just completely left it. And that goes back to what you're saying. It's just all the mind games, isn't it? We always say play the, play the ball, not the man, but 
Uh, with, with regards, I met, I met Shane a few times. I actually packed in a game versus Australia. It was a one-day game, probably in 97. The game got rained off and we, we had a chat in, uh, in, in the bar afterwards. Yeah, a couple of times I had a chat with him and every time he was really, really nice, nice bloke down to earth. I had a lot of time for everyone. I, I remember him when he played for Hampshire against Glamorgan. He basically, he, I don't think he signed autographs during the day, but he'd get everyone queuing up at the end and he wouldn't, he'd sign every signature till the last person's gone. Even my mother, she got a hat, which I think I've got in the house somewhere, which she queued up for him to sign. He signed it. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant stuff. You've now played three test matches for England and England are unbeaten in all those games. You won the one against West Indies, beat Australia, and you drew that other game. So you were clearly a lucky charm for the side, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, people ask me, uh, why did I play more? I honestly, I don't know. The last test I played was a winning test. It was a test I got four wickets in. I got picked for the, Aust- the West Indies tour uh, that winter. Should have played. I had a bit of a back injury at the, in in some of the in the warm up games in the West Indies. So I had a back spasm. Thought I couldn't bowl again, but I did bowl in that game. Bowled and got four wickets in the second innings of that game. So going into the, the first test, I was actually fit to play. It's been reported in some places that I that I was injured, but I wasn't. I was fit and ready to play, and I was told that because again the wicket didn't look like a seamer's wicket, it, it might suit swing. Alan Eggleston, who sadly passed away recently, he played instead of me in that test match. That was probably the most disappointing one not get selected for. I should have played that test match because I played the last on a good wicket at the Oval against Australia. And there was absolutely no reason why I, I, I shouldn't have played that one, really. You know, the swing is so, as it happened, it didn't swing and the ball went up and down a bit, which would probably have suited me. It's more like a Cardiff wicket than anything else. So I, sh- I should have played it. It's Sabina Park, that game was. So, yeah, I look back at that game and that was... You know, I didn't play that game. And then as, as the series went on, I didn't get as much bowling in it as I, as I would normally have done. So I, I kind of lost a little bit of rhythm and a little bit of confidence. Didn't do that well in the other warm-up games. Played in four one-day internationals. Did okay in a, in a couple. You know, I needed to play cricket to keep my form going. And basically on a tour like that, you don't get the opportunity to do so. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, yeah, it's interesting what you say about the injury because that I, you know, when I've been doing the research for this, it says you had a back injury that kept you out of the first test. So it's interesting the way things change, isn't it, over time? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as I said, it wasn't true. <laughs> I, I did have a back injury, but it, it didn't keep me up to the test. And you know, I was fit to play. You're definitely a lucky charm again, because if you look at those ODIs, England only won two of those games and you played in both of them. I'm at a loss. <laughs> I did. I did play two of the ones we got armored in as well. Right? <laughs> I'm skimming over those ones. <laughs> We're up to 1994. You were one of the five Wisdom Cricketers of the Year. And the other four were all Aussies. David Boone, Ian Healy, Murph Hughes and Shane Warne. So that's pretty exalted company, should we say. Yeah. I, I, I have to admit, every time someone gives me a Wisdom from 94 to sign, I, I do enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> I just remind, I flip through the pages, remind myself of you know, the company I was in that year. But yeah, they were all Aussies and, and me. Weird, weird. <laughs> so strange. But is that a proud moment from an individual point of view? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's in a period, I'm not sure how long wisdom's been handing out the five wisdom curriculums here, but if you think about it, even if it's if it's 120 years, you're one of probably 600 people who've, who've got that accolade. Yeah, so not not many Glamorgan players have, have got it. So fantastic moment. Uh, one of my proudest moments is really was being placed by the year in 93, at the end of the season awards there, uh, Max Boyce. Presented me with the with the with the prize, so that was uh, yeah, that was a nice moment, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, so ninety three, yeah, because we we've jumped ahead a bit with obviously just completing your international career, but and you've already mentioned it that first trophy for Glamorgan for you know for decades in the Sunday League. Do you remember the last game when you actually clinched the clinched the title? Yeah, it was a brilliant day. We travelled to the ground as normal a couple of hours before the game. Sorry, this was down in Canterbury, wasn't it, against Kent? Yeah, Canterbury, yeah. Uh, and basically, they were, we were first and second. So it was literally whoever won the game won the, you know, won, won the, the league. So it was like a, it was a cut final, really. And they played some really good cricket all year as well. I think they were up there in the championship. I think they might have been second in the championship. But, but we were, yeah, so we've been rivals all summer. Travelling the ground in the morning, massive crowd. We got into the ground, took us, took us a while to get there. 
Yeah, we're running around the ground. It was full before the start of the game. It was just unbelievable atmosphere. I think there were 12, 13,000 people there and yeah, probably half of them were Welsh, maybe. Uh, it sounded like it if, it if it wasn't. So, yeah, good game of cricket. Well, we bowled first. We It was a wicket. It was a bit tacky. We bowled well all year. I mean, the bowling unit was was an extremely accurate attack. Uh, no weak links, really. You know, Ronald Lefebvre and myself, Adrian Dale, Steve Barwick, the Richards bowled a few of us. Hopefully I met, missed anyone there. But yeah, very accurate attack. We, we contained them to 200, just over 200, 50 overs, which even then, I mean, that, that's a low score. Even then, that's a low score. I think we, we averaged around, we, got, we were used to getting 250s, 260s, perhaps in 50 over format back then. But, you know, 200 was quite a very gettable score. And we got it. I mean, the, the, the underlying memory there, of course, is for most people who were there was would have been uh, Tony Cotty and Viv Richards running off. Tony Cotty, you know, hitting, hitting the winning runs, uh, running off with Viv. I mean, almost in tears. Viv, when he got to the restroom, he was in tears. I mean, it was, that summed it up for, for me winning that. Um, it was great as a Glamorgan cricketer winning a trophy after a period of time. But, but to see how much it meant to, to Viv to finish on a high was kind of said it all, really. There was a moment in the game where we thought... Uh, we could have lost it. There was a no-ball incident. Uh, Duncan Spencer was bowling pretty quick at the time. Bowler bumper, Viv, uh, mishooked it. He got caught. And then to the relief of everyone, uh, all of Glamorgan supporters, the Welsh supporters, they had played David Constant, I think it was, had his arm out, no ball. So after that, the, you know, we, we cruised home, really. We won plenty of time to spare, six wickets in hand. Yeah. I mean, we've spoken a lot about Viv Richards, and you know, that's a brilliant story because you know everything that he's achieved in the game to, to be that, elated that he's won that title with Glamorgan is brilliant but let's move on to 97 because we've summed up your international career and then but you still you know continue playing until 2001 for Glamorgan so you had such a long career but uh, 1997 must have been the highlight of that time yeah no 97 would, would win the county championship was probably the highlight of my career I mean I had quite a lot of highlights of test matches win the Sunday league but to win the county championship I mean basically I mean tried for since 86 and then we hadn't won the championship since 69 so nearly 40 years since since we won the championship last and yeah I mean again we played some brilliant cricket that year different bowl attack Darren Thomas had come into it we added a bit more and Wacker Eunice was was obviously instrumental as well so a bowling attack from being uh, a workman like accurate attack became something a little bit more than that you know with a spearhead and Wacker Eunice we had Crofty was in his prime Dean Costco was getting better and Darren Thomas a young up and coming fast bowler so and we, were, we had a little bit of everything and I'll back him. And we, we never, I think there's a stack up there. We, we never fielded more than 60 odd overs, which is remarkable. I mean, you, you, you're almost staying fresh all the time. You're never in the field that long because you're pulling sides out. We had a couple of ups and downs. So we were all up to 31 against Middlesex in, in a particular game, which Duncan Fletcher basically put down to a little bit of a blip, but he was, he was right. I mean, it was, it was literally an hour, an hour's worth of cricket, which went badly wrong. But we were far and away the best side that year. I think we had four bowlers over 50 wickets, so, and everyone, you know, basically all the batters, has scored runs. So everything came together you know, experienced team, good players, and a belief. We played, uh, you know, we played Somerset the last game in Taunton. But there was a bit of weather around. We bowled first morning. Wacky Unis was, uh, was a little bit ill on the first morning, but, you know, he managed to. You know, get him on the park. He got four wickets, and yeah, I mean, we and now backed in in that game. I think we got five hundred in about ninety overs, hundred overs, something like that. So we, we created a, a lot of time in the game to bowl side out. So when we got the opportunity, thankfully, by the end of the third day, we won the game. There was a forecast on the fourth day that it was going to rain all day, so we we kind of deep down knew we had to finish it that day, which which we did. And we, yeah, I mean, we won by. We won by 10 wickets fairly comfortably. And uh, oddly, the next day was a beautiful sunny day. It wouldn't have made any difference anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, fantastic celebrations after that. Yeah. And you mentioned Wacker Eunice. I mean, if you look at the county championship that season, you know, everyone remembers how brilliant he was. But he took 68 wickets at 22.8. You took 61 at 22.83. So, you know, your stats are almost identical that season. It's identical. Yeah, I always, I always tell people, one more wicket, that would be top of the averages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you, if you work it out, it is. Don't, don't ask me why I work that one out, because uh, why, why not? Isn't it? But yeah, they were, so, they were so close together. It was, it was unbelievable. He, his strike grip was better than mine, but I, I was uh, more, I, I, I conceded less runs than he did, basically. So we complemented each other very well. 
yeah, to bowl with him at the other end. Um, he he didn't worry about economy rates whatsoever. He he ran in and his his sole sole thing was just to get a wicket every ball. My mine was a bit more a bit more methodical, I, I guess. <laughs> All right, and then just two final questions, just to kind of bring this full circle. I mean, you know, we're mainly talking about your test career, your one uh, test in the Ashes, but but just to link it to Glamorgan, do you think not just yourself, but some of the other Glamorgan players who were so influential in that championship winning team and other seasons should have played more tests for England. So let's just run through them. Matthew Maynard only played four tests, Hugh Morris three, and Steve James two. Why do you think those three and yourself didn't play more for England? Um, it, it's, it's, you know, the, the batsman I feel sorry for more than anything because you get one ch- chance as a batter. I mean, as a bowler, you, you bowl a number of balls. So you, you get a good look at someone, see whether they like a test level. So I, I kind of understand if a, if, a, if a bowler gets left out of the next test because he hasn't bowled very well, I, I, I get that. But for a batter who's, you know, gets two good balls, in a, like Steve James played two tests, one against South Africa, one against Sri Lanka, I think. You know, he's playing against South Africa, against Alan Donald, who I think got him out. It takes time to get used to that kind of quality. So him in particular, I think he probably deserves some more tests. You know, all three should have played more for sure. For sure. Given their, you know, given their first class records, the amount of hundreds they've got between them, um, so absolutely, hundred percent, they should have played more. What you did do, though, I mean, you know, Steve James didn't even manage to play in the Ashes, but you did. So, final question to you: What did it mean to play in the Ashes? Well, it, 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 you know, playing Test cricket is is kind of you think that's the pinnacle, but to play in a, you know in the greatest Test series that has ever been, which is you know playing in Ashes. Tops it all, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's another cliche. It doesn't get any better than that. I don't think it. I mean, the closest would be winning the county championship. So those two, those two together, I, I won't separate them. Um, they, they they mean as much to me as you know each other. Yes, hard to separate those twin achievements, but not hard to say that Steve Watkin was one of the best and most consistent Glamorgan players of all time. A big thank you to him for his time and memories. And with two wins and one draw in his three Test matches for England including telling contributions in the two wins, maybe, just maybe, he should have had more opportunities. I'll leave you to debate that as we fast forward to the 1994-95 Ashes in Australia and turn our attention to the leg spinner, Peter McIntyre. We'll find out why Peter's international career was hampered by his blonde problem and why Magic Mountain was the place to go when he wanted some rest and recuperation. But that's for another day. Until then, I've been Graham Barrett, and this has been Once Upon a Time in the Ashes.